So we're here tonight. Tonight our topic is a biblical approach to mental health. Now this is a very deliberate title. It doesn't say the biblical solution to mental health. It is a biblical approach to mental health. Yes, I will pose a few uh, practical things that I think are helpful for us when we're dealing with mental illness. But really the topic is around um, what does the Bible say? Like how are we as Christians to understand the whole conversation, not just around mental illness, but around mental health? So mental health is this whole picture. We're seeing this this big movement towards mindfulness and all this sort of stuff today. It's an approach of what is the Bible saying and what do we as, as Christians, what are we as children of God, children of the Word of God, what is the foundation that we stand on? And then what does that mean for us as we minister to other people? What does it mean for us as we deal with mental health, as we cope with it in, in our world right now? And many of you would be aware uh, in the last week that this has, it's only raised its head even further uh, in light of what happened over at Emmaus College and our prayers are with them. Um, one of our members of our congregation is the home class teacher of, of the student who did take her own life. And so... Before we begin, I'm just going to pray for him and pray for that school. Is that okay? And then we'll get into it. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good. And we just declare that now. You are good. You are true. You speak today. And you are for us and not against us. And so, Lord, right now we lift up that school. We lift up that community We lift up everyone impacted by it and we pray as a Christian school that the light of the gospel would shine forth and we know even when it's confusing that you turn all things together for the good for those who love you. And so Father, take this horrible situation, turn it towards your glory and draw people to the eternal hope that is only found in Christ and Christ alone. We surrender them to you in the precious name of Jesus and we surrender this night to you. We surrender this whole conversation to you, Lord. Take the words of my mouth and let them be yours. Lord, speak. Father, the things that I've prepared that are not of you, may they just fall to the ground. May the things that you want to say that I haven't prepared, may you raise them up. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Give us a word in season that will impact, that will transform, and that will empower. We pray in Jesus' name and all the saints said, Amen. Amen. So I want to begin with disclaimers, if that's okay. Firstly, this is a massive topic, and you all know that. There's a reason you're here tonight. This is a huge topic in our society today. It's a topic that I cannot cover in its entirety in an entire year's worth of sermons, let alone one potentially 40-minute message. You're forgiven. <laughs> so that, let's just get that out the bag right away. The goal, therefore, tonight is not to finish the conversation, it's to start the conversation, Okay. It's not to finish the conversation, it's to start the conversation. I'm going to bring some some ideas that have been significant in my life, uh, things that I have... I've wrestled with things that I've studied that I have deep convictions around. Um, But my prayer is for those of you who hang around for dinner, as you sit at your tables, that you won't just talk about how poor Port Adelaide's season is going, (laughs) but you will talk... And what a shock it was that the Crows actually won a game. (laughs) But but that you would take the time to converse around this topic, that you would throw ideas around, that you'd share stories, share experiences, and ultimately that you'd pray for one another uh, and that we'd journey together in this. Is that all right? That's the prayer. For those of you who aren't hanging around for dinner, go and do that in your week. Find people, talk about it. Don't let it just be, oh, that was an interesting sermon. Let's call it a sermon. No, let's, let's let this be the start of a conversation. Is that good? Yeah. Secondly, the second disclaimer is I am not a trained psychologist and I am not a trained psychiatrist, okay? So there's a whole lot of stuff that I don't know. What I am is someone who uh, loves the Word of God, 
Uh, I've worked in the education sector for 10 years in a, in a pastoral care counselling role where I've dealt with enormous amounts of mental health. I have a degree in medical science where I majored in physiology and neuroscience, so I know a bit about the brain. Uh, and I'm a preacher who loves the word, as I said before. Uh, and when you're in pastoral ministry, you come across some things. So 17 years of experience in working with people. I don't have all of the answers, but I serve the God who does. And I believe that by his spirit, he brings wisdom and that he brings understanding. And sometimes he brings peace even when there's no clarity. And my prayer again tonight is that as we leave here, we'd have like some, something to stand on, but also we'd have a deep sense of trust and a deep sense of peace. Like Job at the end of his whole life's ordeal and all that he went through with all the depression that he faced and all the trial where he gets to the end and he's resting in the nature and character of God. So that's the context that I'm coming at. Uh, And my third disclaimer is after this session that we have, if you want to go deeper and you're looking for more information, there are many, many, many wonderful Christian psychiatrists and psychologists out there who have put hundreds of hours worth of content available freely on YouTube. One guy in particular who I have found extremely helpful over the years is a guy called Dr. Matthew Stafford. If you want to write that down, Dr. Matthew Stafford, um, he's absolutely brilliant and he's got a whole host of information on topics that are really diving into specifics as opposed to the broad kind of topic that we're going to talk about tonight. So there's my disclaimers. Um, With that said, where do we begin? I think the best place to begin is actually a definition. A definition. Whenever you're preaching a sermon, here's a note to young preachers, start with a word search and begin to define what it is that you're looking at. So when we talk about a biblical approach to mental health, here's what Beyond Blue defines mental health as. They say mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realises his or her own potential. They can cope with the normal stresses of life. I should have put this up on the slide, sorry. Can work productively and fruitfully and are able to make a contribution to his or her community. Let me read that again. Mental health is a state of well-being. So the mind is mentally healthy when every individual realises their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully and can make a contribution to his or her community. So the goal is that we would see a society that is mentally healthy. Amen? Mental illness, therefore, or mental disorder is when this equilibrium is upset. When that picture is not a reality. And so the World Health Organization defines a mental disorder or mental illness as this. A clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation or behavior, usually associated with distress or impairment in important areas of functioning. I'll read it again. A clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation or behavior associated with distress or impairment in important areas of functioning. There's your, uh, your psychiatric definitions of mental health and mental illness. There's another doctor who I've really enjoyed reading, a, a lady called Dr. Deborah Cornier. Uh, and this is how she defines mental illness. I think it's so profound. I don't even think she realises how profound it is. She says that mental illness is a loss of a sense of self. Let that resonate for a minute. Mental illness is a loss of a true sense of self. A true understanding of who I am. This is me now building on what I read. A true understanding of who I am. You could even use this beautiful word, identity. When I know who I am truly, and that's what we're going to look at in a second and that resonates within me, and that sits in my gut as true and says, yes, then you will have mental health. When that true sense of self is disturbed or incorrect within you, 
That is a mental illness. I think it's a beautiful definition. I think she's hit the nail on the head. And we'll get to that in a second, but just contextually, so you understand how many people have lost this true sense of self, how significant this issue is in our society today. When you look at the latest data from the census, the last census that we did, this is the result. 43.7% of Australians have experienced, between the age of 16 and 85, have experienced mental illness. That's almost half of Australia, of adult Australia, have experienced mental illness. What's the, I'm going to get preaching. What's the lie that is being told to us when we experience mental illness? It's that I'm all alone. No, you're not. 43.7% of people know what you're going through. That's a powerful thing to hold on to. One in five or 4.2 million people in Australia have had mental illness that has endured for over 12 months. Significant clinical mental illness that has lasted for over 12 months. That's one in five Australians. Anxiety is the most common Form of mental illness in 12-month disorders at 3.3 million Australians. Almost two in five people, 39.6%, aged between 16 and 24, have experienced a 12-month ongoing mental illness. That's in it, like 16 to 24, it's just ramping up, Right? Females experienced higher rates than males of anxiety disorders, 21% compared with 12. And males have almost twice the rate of substance abuse disorders to females, 4.4% compared with 2.3. And suicide is the second leading cause of death in Australia in people aged between 16 and 29. I would call that a pandemic. Because that's not just Australia. It's actually, as you look at the stats all over the world, in all cultures all over the world, the numbers are really, really similar. There is a significant problem in society today with mental illness. And for the large part, the church has been silent. And the reason that the church has been silent is either because we've been too afraid to touch it we don't, we're not educated, so we don't think we can speak into it. Or the advice we give is just, uh, I'm going to call it hyper charismatic and really unhelpful. For example, let's say I've gone for a 42 kilometre run in the heat and I come in here and I'm dehydrated and I'm about to pass out. What do I need? Water. If I come in here, it would be great if I've done this huge run, I've walked in here, I'm almost dying of dehydration. It is fantastic that people would gather around me, lay hands on me and say, thank you, Lord, I believe for healing and restoration in Jesus' name. That's wonderful. But what I need is water. And I think sometimes in the church, what we've done is we've hyper-spiritualised some things that actually need physical, practical care. Yes? And that's, that's a bit of a concern. That's one arm. But on the other side, we've lost sight of the fact that we're more than just flesh. And sometimes there is a spiritual side. And because we don't want to go there and we don't want to touch it, we're just going, you need water. And actually what I need is prayer. And so what we're going to do tonight is look at what is the self? How do we re- rediscover a true sense of self, the true identity of self? What fundamentally Deborah Cornier is saying is, what does it mean to be human? What is the biblical approach to mental health? It's getting a biblical picture of what it means to be human. And when we understand what it means to be human, then we can begin to minister to the human in an appropriate way. Are you with me? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And we're going to begin right here in Genesis chapter 1. We always start from the very beginning because it's the very best place to start. Thank you, someone who likes old school movies. Okay, what does it mean to be me? Go to Genesis chapter 1. 
Genesis 1, it's the story of creation. It's the story of God creating the heavens and the earth. And he goes through and we know that story. And you get to verse 26 and this is what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind or humanity, depending on the translation that you have, in his own image, in the image of God. Three times in our image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. So when we understand, first and foremost, a human being is someone who is made in the image of God. Male and female, made in the image of God. That means male and female together form this beautiful picture of what it means of representing God to the world. We are made in His image. A part of our identity is image bearer, right? Image bearer. That there's this incredible part of being human that is distinct from everything else in creation. Everything else in creation, God spoke and it was. Human being, He says, let us make Mankind in our image. Now, how does he do that? Keep going, go to Genesis chapter 2. And this is where it gets really, really good. Genesis 2, verse 7. Are you ready for a bit of Hebrew? Are we ready for some? Can I teach for a little bit? Are we okay with that? I told you it's going to be a bit seminary. Is that okay? All right, Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And that word man is the Hebrew word Adam, Adam. From the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Okay, so when God, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Here's what we have to understand. First and foremost, it's God who creates. God does it, you're not an accident. Can I get an amen, somebody? You are not an accident. 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 Over the last 80 years, the message that has come to humanity through education is that you are nothing more than the product of nothing colliding, causing an explosion, which resulted in a series of happenstance happenstance circumstances and ultimately the evolution of life. Now you can either believe that nothing created something or you can believe that there always was someone who created everything. I personally find it much easier and more logical to believe that there always was an intelligence that created intelligence rather than believing that nothing somehow collided. How does nothing collide? I don't know. But that nothing collided and therefore gave rise to intelligence. The the creation account is a logical account, friends. It's a logical account. And what it does is it gives humanity purpose And it gives humanity value that you are made, 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 made in the image of God. Human beings are special, unique, different from anything else. That gives us intrinsic worth and infinite value whether your high school friends think so or not. Whether your boss is at work, think so or not, you have value because you are made. Everyone say made. made. In the image of God. That's who you are. That's who I am. That's who we are. Special. Psalm 139. 
It's a beautiful psalm. Read it. I won't quote it all right now, but it's a beautiful psalm talking about the fact that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And here's the thing. For the last 80 years, when the mental health rates have skyrocketed, when you look at the whole stats around it, I just wonder if something, if there's a connect there that just maybe when we start telling human beings they have no value... Maybe they're connected. Maybe the lie that you have no value and therefore no purpose and no reason being here, if we kill that lie right here, right now, and we declare the truth over humanity that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of a living God, and therefore it doesn't matter what anybody else says, you have purpose and worth, just maybe that's the foundation, cornerstone of beginning to understand how to minister to people suffering with mental health. Just maybe it explains the next step when we, oh, I've got to get on target. But the, the whole idea that Jesus Christ, the living God himself, didn't just make us in his image, but chose to come and lay his life down on a cross so that we would know the value, so that we would be connected to Him. How much are you worth? It's what someone is prepared to pay for you. And God paid for you with the blood of the eternal Son of God. Like the most val... Like, oh! You are valuable. I didn't come to preach. I came to do a seminar. So you're made in the image of God. Then the Lord God formed, formed, formed a man from the dust. Now that word dust is the Hebrew word ofar. Everyone say ofar. So a human being, image of God, made from dust, ofar. Also can be translated this whole idea of flesh. Interesting. The physical dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Hebrew word here, breath of life, is the Hebrew word nishama. Everyone say nishama. <laughs> and it means spirit. It means the spirit of God, that he breathed a spirit into us. So there's dust, there's physical and there's spirit. Watch what happens when spirit, nishama, and afar collide, it says, and man became a living being. Being is the Hebrew word nefesh. Everyone say nefesh. And the other, tran- you could be translated soul, emotion, mind, consciousness. Oh, when I was doing neuroscience, it was so funny. We were sitting there and we would sit in all these different lectures and we'd have all these experts coming in talking about the studies they were doing on consciousness. And they kept talking about these incredible studies they were doing, but no one ever could explain what consciousness was, right? They kept saying, oh, we're so close. Like we're seeing this with mice and we're seeing that. And I remember at the end of this whole semester, I put my hand up and said, so can you please explain to me what consciousness is? And they did, you know, the typical... (laughs) Couldn't answer it. And I was like, I didn't do this in the lecture, but I did it in my tune. I was like, it's funny because like the Hebrew, um, the ancient Hebrew language actually has a word for consciousness. It's called nefesh. It, It means soul. It means that like we have... There's, there's a light behind the eyes. It's more than atoms colliding, just banging into one another. There's actually something l- more to me than just meets the eye. And so we see that we are dust, physical, spirit and soul. You could say body, mind, emotion, spirit. Oh, what does that sound like? That sounds like mindfulness, doesn't it? Can we put the mindfulness wheel up? This is, this is an interesting thing because in the last few years, mindfulness has become a big deal, right? And I was a high school teacher and we were right into mindfulness. I wasn't, but they were. <laughs> and this is what they talk about, the wellness wheel. That when you have all of these things in life, that you fill each bucket appropriately, then you will be well. You will have mental health. Now, if you break them down, what do you see? You see, you see physical, you see body, you see 
intelligence, so you kind of see mind, soul, and spirit. Occupation, social, environmental, that's all physical. Emotions, intellectual, that's kind of, oh, oh, that's, that's a far nishma and nefesh. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Does anyone else find that interesting? That modern psychologists have realised that all of these things are important for a human being? Could it be that all of these things are important for a human being because that is the essence of what a human being is? (laughs) I'm just putting it out there. It's just an idea. That just maybe a human being is not an accident and not just stuff colliding, but maybe when God said, I created you this way, and maybe that the fact that we are physical, that we are spiritual and that we have a soul, maybe that's a part of what it means to be human. And maybe instead of telling everybody that that doesn't exist and teaching people they're an accident, if we taught people that this is what a human being is and therefore you have value and we gave them the why behind the what, just maybe we'll start to see some changes in mental health. Because you can fill buckets, but if you fill buckets, all you're trying to do is find balance. But when you speak meaning and you speak truth, truth sets people free. And so we have to begin to understand this is who we are. And and it's interconnected. Because when you have buckets... It's, it's saying that we're separate. What it's, what it's doing is it's dividing a human being into categories, right? Let's just call that mind as well because it's the same idea. How's everybody going? So it's saying these are categories, right? So we've got to look after body. We've got to look after spirit. We've got to look after soul. But you can't actually separate them. Because the body was lifeless, the spirit came in, the breath came in, the nishma came in and it was when the spirit collided with the flesh that it gave rise to a soul. You can't separate them in the human experience, which means when I have something happen to me physically, it will affect me emotionally because the two are connected. When I have a spiritual encounter with God, it will impact me physically. It will impact me emotionally because it's all connected. It's why the Bible talks about countenance. When you encounter God, your countenance changes because a spiritual encounter with the living God will impact my spirit, which will impact my emotions and will impact me physically. They're all together, right? So we need to be very careful when we minister to understand that, yeah, 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 maybe something happened to someone in the body, but that is going to have implications on the soul and the spirit. Maybe there's a spiritual thing going on that's going to have implications on the soul and the body. Maybe it's a trauma thing, an emotional thing that's going to impact my spiritual and my body. That's what it means to be human. That's what it means to be an image bearer. That's what it means to have a sense of self. How's everybody going? We all right? You need to stand up for a second, twirl around and sit back down. If you do, just get up and do it. Like, I get it. I, like, I'm the most fidgety person here. So... This is what I want us to understand, that this is the key, that we are body, soul and spirit and we are all in connect, interconnected and it's not buckets, it's one. It's one that's meshed together and that is what it means to be human. So let's shift gears. How do we therefore minister to mental health? What do we need to understand about mental health? It means that a mental illness could, like, could be initiated, the root cause of a mental illness could begin in any one of these things, but it will impact the others. And we as ministers, as the church today, need to be discerning enough to recognise where our lane is and we need to be discerning enough to offer wisdom in all the areas. So here's what I want to do. I want to run through the different areas and just give a few practical ideas and then we'll pray and then we'll eat dinner. Sound good? So if mental illness is beginning with the body, 
We have to recognise, like I said before, sometimes mental illness is the result of a physical issue. Sometimes mental illness is is a physical issue. Something's gone wrong with the brain. The brain needs rewiring or the brain needs help. And there is a physical solution which will therefore help with the soul, help with the mind, help with the emotions and uplift our spirits. Right? Sometimes that is the case. And so that there's some physical things. And we need to understand when is the appropriate time. If someone's dealing with this... Do you know what? Go and get help. Go and see a doctor. There are experts. There are beautiful Christian psychiatrists. There are beautifully well-trained psychologists who are able to help. And what it means for us as a church is we recognise the physical. We recognise there's a need. What should we do? Well, we should pray in faith. We should absolutely pray in faith. Why? Because we believe in a God who heals today. We believe, I believe that the the God who created in Genesis 1-1 heals today. And so we pray in faith. We pray for physical healing. We pray that whatever's gone wrong in the mind would be restored. But we don't then say, oh, that didn't work. You're demon possessed. (laughs) Along with the prayer, along with that, we say, okay, you need, like, let's get you some physical help. Let's go to a doctor and let's start getting this sorted out. Because just maybe if it's physical, just maybe the Lord will heal through the wisdom of modern medicine. Because all wisdom, all good things come from above. All great medical discoveries, God already had figured out when he created the earth. And so he gives wisdom to humanity and it's actually like modern medicine is a gift of God. It is not anti-Christ to visit a doctor. Can I just say that? (laughs) If you have an issue with that, let's talk about it later. But it is not anti-Christ to visit a physician who is trained in medicine, who is an expert in their field to go and get help where help is needed. Sometimes you go into into church environments and you're made to feel like you're anti-Jesus or something's wrong with you because you've got a physical ailment. Jesus loves you. We love you. We want you to get well. If it starts in the physical, please go and get help. And our job as the church is to direct people to good care. Yes? Go and get Good care. Because this is what Jesus did. If you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, you're going to see three stories. Mark chapter 5 is a powerful illustration of Jesus dealing with mental health And it's a powerful illustration of the three root causes of mental health in humanity. You see, what you're going to see as you read through this, but we're not going to read through the whole passage together, but you're going to see a woman with the issue of blood who has an anxiety fear response. So she's suffering from fear and anxiety because she has a physical issue. Look how Jesus ministers to her as you read through that. Jesus deals with the physical issue, but he also meets her where she's at. He deals with the whole self and brings her into a holistic healing. The great physician deals with the physical and we see emotional, spiritual restoration. There's another story of uh, a man possessed by the demonic. And at the end of that story, like Jesus deals with the issue. He casts out the demonic it says, you don't belong here. And all of a sudden the man is sitting there and the, the word is you. It says he was in his right mind. So Jesus dealt with the issue, but he also ministered to the whole self, the whole person, brought him into a physical posture and an emotional healing. And you also see uh, that another uh, story where uh, someone is, suffering from trauma and grief, we see, let's actually, I want to speak to this one for just a second. Um, So let's 
Let's go there. This is where we see Jesus raising the dead girl. So Jesus crosses over the boat to the other side of the lake and a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, what did he do? He fell at Jesus' feet. What do you think is going on in his heart right now? He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Then there's the woman with the issue of blood. And then verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? What's going on? Put yourself in Jairus' shoes. Is he happy? (laughs) I would say he's probably depressed. Why? Because of emotional trauma. Because his daughter is dead. And the response is, why bother? Leave him alone. But what Jesus does is he ministers to the whole self. He deals, he speaks to the heart. Then he goes and raises the daughter from the dead, which is an awesome thing that Jesus can do (laughs) and will do at the end of days. But we see this guy suffering an emotional trauma. He's physically well, but he is depressed. He is suffering because of external circumstances that have grieved his soul. So in Mark 5, you see these these three forms of illness. Do you see that? And Jesus in each one just addresses the issue and he addresses what needs to be addressed in such a beautiful way. And so that is what speaks to us. That, That is what his ministry informs the way that we minister. Where there's a physical need, let's give people the physical tools to to approach it. Right, And so, yeah, one is modern medicine. Go and see a doctor. Other times, there's, there's a whole heap of things that, that we talk about with, with the physical to get well. Like, let's encourage healthy habits. Let's eat well. Yeah? Let's exercise. All of these things are helpful. Let's, let's be in community. That's a physical thing that we do. And every single bit of research around mental health reveals that community is a positive thing for mental health. Let's practice gratitude. Like speak, affirm gratitude. Thank you, Sam. And let's be a people who declare truth. Speaking is a physical thing we do. And the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. It is actually a physical thing. Truth speaking actually has an impact on the body. It's a, can I give you an example from my own life? And I'll get a little bit vulnerable. Is that all right? I don't tell this story to many, many people. When I was, in, um, when I was a teenager, I wrestled with, I, I will call them inner demons. Uh, and as a teenager, I, you could, nowadays, like I wasn't diagnosed obsessive compulsive, but if I went to a doctor, they would have said, Dave, you have some issues. So when I would walk down the street, I couldn't step on cracks. And I wouldn't let myself. And I'd try and be super sly about it. I'd be like... And I had this pattern when I would come home where I had to jump up and touch the roof of the house in all these certain places. So I'd walk in, I'd get out of the car, I'd jump up and I'd touch the veranda. I'd then get to the front door, I'd touch the roof, I'd walk in the front door, I'd touch the roof, I'd go to the cupboard, I'd touch the roof, I'd go to the fridge, I'd touch the roof, I'd then go into the kitchen, I'd jump up and I'd touch the roof and then I was okay to get on with my day. And it started off as just a little thing that I did and then it just became a pattern of behaviour And that pattern of behaviour unwittingly was starting to get a little bit of control on the way that I was living my life. Um, At the time, I probably would have called it superstitious, where I thought that if I didn't do these things, a voice was telling me if I didn't do these things, I would not be successful at the next thing that I was putting my hand to. Lies. And I remember my sister 
was studying um, human movement and she made an off the cuff comment one day. She goes, Dave, you've got obsessive compulsive. She sort of said it just as a, you've got this. And at the time I was like, no, I don't. And she's like, don't touch the roof. <laughs> I was like, I don't have to do what you say. I'm not controlled by you. What did I do? Touch the roof. And I remember um, leaving for a basketball game because I had all these things. I had all these patterns of behaviour that I would follow and I'd always say the same thing to my, my dad as I left. And I'd, like it was just a phrase around um, like pray for me that I'll have one, two, three. Like what it, it was just the same thing that I said. And one day, and this is where things began to change for me, one day my dad, instead of just saying, no worries, Dave, I don't know if he realised something was going on in me or it was just a God thing. He just said, you know God is for you whether I pray or not. And I remember getting in the car and for whatever reason, a word of truth got in my head and I was freaking out. I just remember driving being like, what? This is like, what if I didn't touch the roof? What if I did step on a crack? And I remember from that day on, I had, and it wasn't easy, but I had to deliberately choose. I remember getting out of the car and being like, <laughs> and trying to force myself not to jump. Now, I wasn't diagnosed OCD. It probably wasn't a thing that we talked about that much back in the day. My sister would tell you that that's exactly what I had. But what I do know as I look back on my life is it was getting a stronghold on me. And what I do know is a word of truth cut, but then I had to take practical physical steps to break and had to intentionally walk out that word of truth so that new neural pathways would be written in my mind. It was a physical thing that, a word, that was impacting my emotions, impacting my walk with the Lord, but I had to physically enact, I had to go and get, like I had to help myself. And there's so much more I could tell you about that. Like I had to make 10 shots in a row in the driveway. I had to swish 10 shots in a row. And if I didn't, like I couldn't go inside until I did. And it would be pouring with rain and I would be crying and I'd get nine in a row and then the 10th one would hit the ring and go in and I would boot the ball down the road because I didn't want to do it, but I had to go and get that ball, come back and make 10 in a row, like swish 10 in a row. I would say that it had a little hold on me <laughs> as I look back. So there's physical things, there's neural pathways that need to be rewritten. Go and get help if that's where you're at. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay, number two. What about this? Trauma, emotional trauma. Sometimes the root cause of mental health isn't something going on up here. Sometimes it's something going on in here. Sometimes, and this could be because of a physical thing. It could be because of abuse. It could be because of a, a whole host of things. It could be because of significant grief, significant trauma in our past. But what it does is it causes uh, something within our soul and it starts to impact us. There's a root that gets in. And so as the church, we need to recognise that, yep, send for help. <laughs> but if it's not the physical, if the physical is not the root, it doesn't like medicine will help level you out emotionally so that you can process some things, but ultimately it won't cure it. Because the root is not in the physical, the root is in the soul. And so our job as the church, again, is to refer to people who know how to help dig out the dross from the soul. This is where things like counselling come into play. Where we said, where you go to a GP, the GP then gives you a recommendation, like uh, we'll sign a script so you can have 10 sessions at LifeWell or a counselling centre. And you go and you talk, how do you bring healing in the soul? Again, we pray, but we speak truth. We expose lies. We, allow, we talk it out. We allow that emotion to come out. We allow truth to come in and we allow healing to begin to happen in the soul. 
But we've got to identify the root. We've got to recognise, hey, if it's grief, grief, abuse, tragedy, rejection, uh, brokenness, whatever it is, we need to deal with that. They talk about the fact that muscles grow, physical muscles grow with time under tension. I think emotional healing happens with time under truth. As we sit under truth, we begin to see emotional healing. And sometimes emotional healing looks like this. Has anybody been there? I feel really good today. Whoa. Oh, I'm feeling a bit better today. But over time, under truth, we get to that equilibrium of an identified true sense of self. We need to keep moving. I've been talking far too long. Number three, and we'll close, we'll close here. How do we minister to the, the spirit? Oh, just quickly. Has anyone? <laughs> I told you it's a seminar. Um, has anyone seen the kids' movie Inside Out? Yes. You know how they have the islands? You know what they represent, right? Neural pathways. That's what this is talking about. It's about making sure we're rewriting neural pathways and the thing that fixes it is truth. Isn't that fascinating? In Inside Out, the thing that fixes it is truth. It's confession as she says, I'm hurting. And this is where the lies come in, is that we think, no, I can't tell people I'm hurting. If you can't tell people you're hurting, it's like a wound that festers. When you blurp it out, and sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it comes out and it's ugly. That's why the church is such a beautiful thing, because you can be as ugly as you want, and we're going to love you. That's the whole point. The church is broken people doing life together. So please be ugly. You have permission to be atrociously ugly. Like snot out the nose, drool down the mouth, hair everywhere. Be ugly because it's in the being ugly that truth comes out. And as truth comes out, then truth can go in and you can begin to experience that emotional healing. You won't get it if you don't confess it. And there's scripture all the way through talking about the power of confession, the power of speaking truth, the the, the power of the Word of God in in bringing that reconciliation. Like Ephesians 5 is glorious. James 5 is magnificent in the way that it speaks about this. And be a people who learn to, to proclaim truth, like praise God even when it's hard. This is why church is so important. Be in church. Come to community. Be around the people of God who you can be real and raw with. That's why Hills Baptist is what it is. We're real and we're raw. We're not perfect, but we love the Lord. So sing your praise to Him. Be in community and declare the truth of God. All right, now we're going to get to the end. The spiritual root. And here's the one that can be a little bit contentious. But if we understand our identity as image bearers and we understand that there is a spiritual realm and we understand, as it tells us in Ephesians 6, that we have enemies and that our our battle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers and powers and authorities of this dark world and we understand that that, there is a spiritual element to creation then we need to understand that sometimes the root cause of depression will be the spiritual. That sometimes we get caught because there is spiritual attack. That there is demonic opposition. I'm speaking the truth. I'm speaking the truth. We do have an adversary. He is a defeated adversary, but he is real and he is cunning and he can only be in one place at one time, but he does have servants and they do have works and effects. And so there can be demonic opposition which comes against the people of God. And as the church, we have to take up our authority in Christ. This is where we be brave and bold. This is our lane. And this is where we pray in faith. Yep, we've sent for help. 
Okay, it's clear that it's not a physical root cause. There's emotional stuff going on, all right? But it's clear, we've been talking about that and digging away at that and it's clear that, okay, that's impacted, but that's not the root cause. Something else is going on. And as the people of God, we pick up the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the tearing down of strongholds. We take up our authority, which is in Christ, because he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And then he empowers the church to go and be his hands and feet in the world. And we have to recognise that if there were people in the scripture who were suffering demonic opposition, why would that have changed today? If Jesus was casting out devils and Jesus said that we would go and do the same, and gave us authority to do the same, why all of a sudden do we say it no longer exists? Because it's a lie. And Satan is the father of lies. And C.S. Lewis says it brilliantly where in, in the screw tape letters where he talks about, let's make them believe we don't exist. So we need to name it and claim it. And here's what I've learned, that when we... When we are ministering in this space, sometimes we're afraid to minister in this space because we're like, oh, but what if someone manifests and everything goes crazy and everyone's running around like causing all sorts of chaos. When you read the scripture, what you will see time and time again, just look at Mark 5, look at the response of the demonic to Jesus. When, they, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he, this is the demoniac, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. <laughs> Verse 10, and he begged Jesus again not to send them out of the area. What do you notice? that the demonic is terrified of Christ Jesus. He wants us to believe that we have to carry in a corner and that he's almighty and all powerful. He is not. He is a serpent whose head has been crushed under the heel of the living God. And the living God has breathed his spirit into the sons and daughters of God. And therefore we have authority and we are called to take up our authority and we are called to speak and we can silence the devil and say, stop, no talking. In the name of Jesus, not in my authority, but in the authority of Jesus, you can silence that devil and you can say, be gone in Jesus' name. And I'm just saying this because as a church, if all we do is deal with this and this, we're not being the church. If all we do is this and forsake this and this, we're not being the church. If we're a counselling centre, we're not the church. The biblical approach to mental health is to recognise that this is what it means to be human And that mental illness can attack at any one of these parts. And our job is to lovingly, graciously minister in each part, referring where necessary, supporting always, praying always, loving always, and always, always, always pointing to the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, hidden in the holy place behind the curtain. Jesus is victorious. He is worth holding on for because he is holding on to you. That is a biblical way of looking at mental health as we understand the whole sense of self. If mental health, if mental illness is a loss of a true sense of self, then the church's role is to help people rediscover the true sense of self. Image bearers, body, soul, spirit, ministering, 
in each part that we might be drawn to our knees under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the start of the conversation. 